Dun, 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 dun. dun. Hello, everyone. Mm, greetings, those on the YouTubes. The FooTubes. Mm, it is us. Lies. And Scandal. And welcome to our third episode of What is this book anyway? Oh, the <laughs> Grind and Cast, where we read the previews from books and try to figure out if they're as nonsense as they sound. I mean, they're pretty nonsensical. Let's let's be real. It's I mean, fine. the last one made Scandal mad, like so mad. It I mean, amazing. it made you pretty angry too. But I, I was, definitely think I was angrier than you. For I sure. was irritated. I, there was an irritation going on, but it, it was definitely a thing. Anyway, so we're going to be looking at, with no context, the preview of the Mad Man's Daughter. And what we're doing really is is just using a library app. So if you live in the United States and you have a library card, you can actually find free apps that allow you to download directly from your library. Library, um, and listen to audiobooks or, or read an ebook, which we're reading the previews of ebooks so, and seeing if they're basically worth it in edgelord <laughs> material or not. Some of them sound so edgelordy. Okay, so um, the Madman, it just has an offer to read a sample before you bought, yep. borrow. So, The Mad Mountain's Daughter by Megan Shepherd. I do not know this author. I do not know this series. I just know that it's the first book of a series. I don't even know if the rest of them are out. Mm -hmm. Here we go, and I will read you the the you know general like cover information afterwards. Yep, because these are the things that we hide from people because we want to see if it actually sounds like, like what it says what it, it is. Sum what was summarized to be. Because, you know, a lot of books actually lie on the back now because what they're trying to do is appeal to a certain audience and then you realize once you start reading them going, oh, this isn't what I signed up for at all. Sometimes it sounds like they're all being written by the same person, basically, and what they they're really trying to do. do. Yeah. And what they're trying to do is pitch them all to a certain audience. Anything that could possibly fall in that audience category, they're writing to find those particular fans. Mm -hmm. So the problem we were having initially, or that I was having especially, was that a lot of the books started sounding incredibly the same. And I'm like, are these books at all the same? Or is it far more a case of the person writing the advertisement? rather, the cover flap mm -hmm. on these books, is trying really hard to make them all sound the same, which is ideally something you would like. Oh, all just right. a bit. <clears throat> Chapter one. The basement hallway is in King's College of Medical Research were dark, even in the daytime. At night, they were like a grave. Rats crawled through corridors that dripped with cold perspiration. The chill in the sunken rooms kept the specimens from rotting and numbed my own flesh, too, through the worn layers of my dress. When I cleaned those rooms late at night, after the medical students had gone home to their warm beds, the sound of my harsh bristle brush echoed in the operating theater, down the twisting halls, into the storage spaces where they kept the things of nightmares. Other people's nightmares, that is. Dead flesh and sharpened scalpels didn't bother me. I was my father's daughter, after all. I wasn't like other girls. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My nightmares were made of darker things. So for me, I'm just like the first thing going, a problem with characters that I have is when she's like, through my worn layers of my, the worn layers of my dress. I'm like, uh -huh. who really thinks about their clothes like that? Might be like my ratty dress. Through uh -huh. the layers of my dress. Through my old freaking dress. <laughs> <laughs> through my old bitch ass dress, okay? <laughs> you motherfuckers, this thing is just old crap, okay? Yeah, you speak so elegantly, even in your mind, to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I actually always have that problem where you're like, really? This is what your character sounds like and this is how in, they speak. In their own head to themselves. So, this they, they go, oh yes, I am Mick Edgelord, Edgelord. And then, you know, to themselves, they go, bad damn, motherfucker. I mean, honestly, I think that would be hilarious. What I say to my peers, oh yes, that sounds like quite a charming diversion. What's going on in my head? Anyway. Okay. Ah! <clears throat> fish. That's yeah, get the fish. Go, get them. I will get them. Hang on. <clears throat> let me let me get my the brush fish. paused against the mortar, frozen by a familiar sound from down the hall. The unwelcome tap, tap, tap of footsteps that meant Dr. Hastings had stayed late. I scrubbed harder, furiously. Foot. But blood had a way of seeping into the tiles, not even hours of work could get them clean. The footsteps came hours. closer. Hours. Hours of laborious scrubbing work. in the laboratory. Oh. <laughs> My laborious laboratory quashling. Anyway, fish quashling. <clears throat> the footsteps came closer until they stopped right behind me. How is it coming then, Juliet? His warm breath brushed the back of my neck. Do I sound? I told myself. 
scouring the blood-stained squares of mortar so hard that my own knuckles bled. Well, that's going to make a difference. Let me grind my flesh into this thing that I'm trying to clean. So that I simultaneously it will completely help. Wait, what? Make it a mess and make it clean at the same time. Anyway. <laughs> well, <clears throat> Sorry, I'm not an edgelord. You're an edgelord. Well, Doctor, I kept it short, hoping he would leave. But he didn't. Overhead, the electric bulb snapped and clicked. I glanced at the silver tips of his shoes, so brightly polished that I could see the reflection of his balding scalp and milky eyes watching me. He wasn't the only professor who worked late. Or the only one whose gaze lingered too long. On <laughs> okay, I heard the only whose gaze. Like he has multiple gay men, or his right, gays, right, his or gays. like gay women. You know, all staring at his gaze. Happy <laughs> Pride Month! Here's the squad. <laughs> Woo! It's his gaze. His milky eyes and his gaze, because you know they have to look for him because you know he's a dumbass. Oh, are they? You know, he's got bad eyes, so he has a hired squad of gays to see the world. <laughs> oh, honey. <laughs> It's not, you don't even it's know. not Queer Eye for Straight Guy. It's Queer Eye so you can see it all. I don't, right? <laughs> it's actually Queer Eye so you have vision. So you have vision. They're seeing eye gaze. Really. They're That's what they are. <laughs> Look, hey, everyone, it's our seeing eye gaze. These are our seeing eye gaze. They have and this is Ronaldo, me. his pure blood bread gaze. <laughs> Oh, God. Purebred gays are very hard to find. You know how that works. <laughs> right? Oh, God. Okay, anyway, sorry. <laughs> all right. I'm super uh, insane. Um, <clears throat> I'm okay. Whose gaze lingered too long. They stood around after he left. Sorry. <laughs> on my bent over backside, but the smell of lye and other chemicals on my clothes deterred the others. Dr. Hastings seemed to relish it. He slipped his pale fingers around my wrist. If you're down scrubbing the floor, did he have to lean all the way down to do this? La, 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 la. standing over I know. and grabs your wrist. Does he have spider arms? Like, oh, oh my God. I would Love. be uncomfortable as well. He stands there, imperious, tall, imposing, bald head shining under the horrible lights, grabs my hand, which is on the floor scrubbing, while he's still standing. That would be horrifying. Your arms, sir. I, I presume the experiments have gone well. Holy shit, actually, like All right. I... Ahem. He slipped his pale fingers around my wrist. I dropped the brush in surprise. Your knuckles are bleeding, he said, pulling me to my feet. It's the cold. It chaps my skin. I tried to tug my hand back, but he held firm. It's nothing. His eyes followed the sleeve of my muslin dress to the stained apron and frayed him. A dress that not even my father's poorest servants would have worn. But that was many years ago, when we lived in the big house on Belgrave Square, where my closet burst with furs and silks and soft lacy things I'd worn only once or twice, since Mother threw out the previous year's fashions like bathwater. That was before the scandal. Now, men seldom looked at my clothes for long. When a girl fell from privilege, men were less interested in her ratty skirts than in what lay underneath, and Dr. Hastings was no different. His eyes settled on my face. My friend Lucy told me I looked like the lead actress from the Brixton, a French woman with high cheekbones and, pale, and skin as pale as bone. Even paler against the dark straight hair she wore swept up in a Swiss style. Chignon? Chignon? Ch uh, ch uh, Chignon? Chignon. Sorry, I believe. In a Swiss style Chignon. I kept my own hair in a simple braid, though a few strands always managed to slip out. Dr. Hastings reached up. You know, they always managed. Sometimes I really get extremely conflicted where we're like, we're having a rape subtext here. Yeah. And it's like they managed to slide out. Like, what you're still trying to make your character sound alluring, which is very creepy and very weird. Well, I just can't help but be pretty because no matter how shitty I wear my clothes, I will always be beautiful. No, kiddo. If you have bad enough hygiene, I don't care how attractive you are. Nope, my hygiene's perfect. It's just my clothes suck ass. I, right. And they're washed. The reason they're ready is because I wash them so often. It's my only dress. It's because I'm a dumbass. Let me let the readers know exactly how beautiful and tempting you are. So it's not his fault. You're so glorious. Oh, well, that's the other thing, too. It feels weirdly like victim blaming. Like, because the thing is, is in this context, usually when you're hearing something like manage to just slip out, that tends to be either very romantic or like sultry or like seductive. It's intimate. It is you very can get personal. You part of my hair. Part of my hair isn't contained. It's 
loose uh-huh. and vulnerable. And for a lot of people, actually, long hair is considered to be incredibly sexual. Yep. It is not actually an impersonal, well, you just happen to have long hair. This is one of the reasons, though, why plenty of people, in my opinion, go, yeah, but women need to have long hair, because women are sexual objects to many individuals. They so are not actually people. Is now a lot of commentary, but anyway. wait, that's all right. Anyway. We never do crap like that. My first thought with some of it always managed to slip out, going, you have no way to pin it down, tie it down, tape it down, water it down, product it down. You can't even smear egg yolk in your hair to seal it down, which is right? well, egg white, which yep. is incredibly inexpensive, so that it won't do this thing that apparently draws men to you. There are ways to do this, but any again, like era you and key on my hair, so you'll stay away from me. You could do that. That actually is a uh, what is it? It's not just a disinfectant. It actually is something they use to treat tan like leather. Mm-hmm. You could tan leather by using urine. Oh yeah, like and you can. It helps with dyeing process as well. All oh, right, here yeah, we go. Yeah. Doctor Hastings reached up to tuck them behind my ear, his fingers rough as parchment against my temple. I cringed inside, but not outside. Oh, but fought to keep his my face blank. Better to give no reaction so he wouldn't be encouraged. But my shaking hands betrayed me. Dr. Hastings smiled thinly. The tip of his tongue snaked out from between his lips. Suddenly the sound of groaning hinges made him startle. I was going to go like, the sound of groaning? I know, it's going to be like... Because he's holding I, your hand. Oh, God. I mean, like, whoa, I'm dude, glad. it takes nothing for you to get off to... Like, wow, you are aroused. Really? They are correct. The average sex time is about three to four. Oh, Lord. He's already been in this room for two minutes. We're almost done. We're almost done. Oh, God. All right. I'm sorry. I know we're making light of this, but the thing is, is that it really is tasteless, in my opinion. This is a very dark way to start a... uh, Especially when you have... Young adult fiction. Especially when, for a lot of people, I'm going, you have no connection to this character. So the easiest way to do this is to force rape on you. Honestly, that's really cheap. One of the unfortunate things about it as well is that this is a reinforcement again of girls value is as a in their object their appearance and in, in their appearance and their desirability visually mm-hmm. so what's under the clothes is how i look what my body is and it's something that i realized recently explaining to a younger individual that i know and i just was talking about books i was literally recommending books to um this <clears throat> to this young woman girl whatever anyway and um it occurred to me as i was like Hey, this book, and I'm describing, you know, synopsis of these books or the general idea why I picked them out or why I recommend them. Mm-hmm. And it was like, this one is unlikely to have a romance plot, given that it has a male protagonist, and there's not one explicitly stated. And then I had to pause and think and went, it's really, really true. Once you get to a certain age of books, women are romanceable. They are the romance object or the romance subject mm-hmm. pretty much almost that's consistently. Their function. And it's very frustrating. And that's what their story is about. Their story is about romance and sex, unlike where other other plots... Actually, it's... if you have a male protagonist, on average, I will say male loosely, um, but you have a, an individual who identifies as a boy or a man um, and goes, you happen to have this as an aside. It's not the main focus of your story, unlike with, you know, other stories that go well this is about a girl or you know like it was the reason why people blew up a lot about brave so i don't know if any of you guys in the audience ever okay. recall if we go into deep oh, this we'll be lost fine, so fine, people fine. didn't like that there wasn't a romance in brave uh-huh Done. pretty much i say but mostly people are really used to there being romance uh-huh if you have a female protagonist of a certain age or more uh-huh particularly in the west mm-hmm. and the west being more like european slash america america north america all right yeah Ahem. Suddenly, the sound of groaning hinges made him startle. My heart pounded wildly at this chance to slip away. And my text went away because I wasn't touching things. All right. Sorry. At this chance to slip away. Um, no. Oh, there we go. Mrs. Bell, the lead lead maid, stuck her gray head through the cracked door. Her mouth curved in its perpetual frown as her beady eyes darted between the professor and me. I'd never been so glad to see her wrinkled face. Juliet, out with you. Oh, she is she going to run into Romeo? She barked. Mary's gone and broken a lamp, and we need another set of hands. I stepped away from Dr. Hastings, relief rolling off me like a cold sweat. My eyes met Mrs. Bell's briefly as I slipped into the hall. I knew that look. She couldn't watch out for me all the time. One day, she might not be there to intercede. The moment I was free of those dark hallways, I dashed into the street. Toward Covent Garden. As the moon hovered low over the London skyline, the harsh wind bit at my calves, 
through worn wool stockings as I waited for a carriage to pass. Again, this sounds like weird brain language, but I get this all the time in first person when it's like inside your head. Is this actually how you're describing these things to yourself? Are you actually thinking my worn wool stockings or are you just going, damn, my legs are cold? <laughs> oh God, cold legs. Right, hey, I have, gotta have holy socks. Or just being like, my socks aren't warm enough, or I just want more clothes, or I want it to be warm. God, I wish I had better socks. Or just, I want it to be warm. God, I want my skin to be warm. God, I want to be warm in general. God, I wish I had a fireplace. specific. And part of me wonders if you wrote a book in someone's actual internal language, if anyone could stand to read it. I, that's also the other question, too. What are you actually writing? Which is why I have a hard, I have a troubled relationship with first person books. Here we are. Most people shockingly do. Remember how they were uh, criticized heavily and then what was it? They really love uh, mentioning that uh, the Mockingjay series, that that, 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 the protagonist, that, 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 that one really popularized first person view. Mm, no. Okay. Across the street. A Fine, figure don't stood. believe me. Yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not of the opinion that The Hunger Games started first-person uh, interest at all. No, I'm just saying that. it really popularized a lot more with that, though, I think. But anyway, go mm. ahead. Across the street, a figure stood in the lee of the big wooden bandstand staircase. <clears throat> you awful creature, Lucy said, slipping out of the shadows. She hugged the collar of her fur coat around her long neck. Her cheeks and nose were red beneath a light sheen of French powder. I've been waiting an hour. I'm sorry. I leaned in and pressed my cheek to hers. Her parents would be horrified to know she had snuck out to meet me. They had encouraged our friendship when father was London's most famous surgeon, but were quick to forbid her to see me after his banishment. Luckily for me, Lucy loved to disobey. They've had me, <clears throat> they've had me working late, all week, opening up some old rooms, I said. I'll be cleaning cobwebs out of my hair for days. She pretended to pluck something distasteful from my hair and grimaced. We both laughed. Honestly. I don't know how you can stand that work, with the rats and beetles and, my God, whatever else lurks down there. Her blue eyes gleamed mischievously. Anyway, come on, the boys are waiting. She snatched my hand and we hurried across the, the courtyard to a red brick building with a stone staircase. Lucy banged the, wa- the horse head knocker twice. Because I look gorgeous and you look like a gorgeous disaster and we're going to be so popular. Wait. Yes, let's go, my homie. And then we'll make out in front of the boys. Or something. I don't know. My first thought here is just going, yes, we're going to go see the boys because I don't like men, but I like boys. Right. Honestly, that's a really common thing. And the man who is after me is creepy and unfortunate. The boy who is after me is hot and cute. Right. And yet the man in usually in this implied time setting can actually support and take care of you. And the boy cannot. Mm-hmm. And, that and most actually people actually went important. I was about to say, most people at the time actually more went for um, stability over, well, romance. It's actually, so culturally speaking, going for romance is actually a very recent thing. It is. All right, here we go. Go ahead. The boys are waiting. Um, She snatched my hand and we hurried across the courtyard. The boys are waiting. To a red brick building with a stone staircase. Lucy banged a horse head knocker twice, right in front of everyone. Oh, the door swung open and a young man. Oh, my God. God, okay, keep going. (laughs) Swung open, and a young man with thick chestnut (laughs) Like a horse! (laughs) My friend's going to die. Like a horse! And a young man with thick chestnut hair and a fine suit appeared. He had Lucy's same fair skin and wide-set eyes. So this... So he looked a bit like a fish. (laughs) (laughs) So... This must be the cousin she told me about. I timidly evaluated his tall forehead, the helix of his ears that projected only a hair too far from the skull. Good looking, I concluded. Uh, You know, forensically speaking. Oh, yeah, forensically. In a very strictly anatomical, Gray's anatomy sort of bullshit. Scientifically measuring out of the proportions, I assume he's attractive to your kind. Uh, He studied me wordlessly in return. In my third-hand coat with worn elbows and frayed satin trim that must have looked out of place next to Lucy's finely tailored one. But to his credit, his grin didn't falter for a moment. She must have warned him that she was bringing a street urchin and not to say anything rude. Let us in, Adam. Because I look like ass. But it's fine that I look like ass because it defends me. But I look like ass. But pretty, pretty ass. Pretty ass. (laughs) 
<laughs> so you look like a donkey? Yeah, the prettiest donkey. A very, donkey. very lovely one. Lovely donkey. Except for donkeys are usually clean and more tailored than I am. Honestly, I, I was going to say, I, I think donkeys, for the most part, people love giving them crap, but they tend to, if they're well cared for, look great. Except for... They're not, just not horses. We're never talking hygiene here. So the thing is, oh, is yeah. the author has completely skipped over anything related to hygiene. And Unlike the last author. Old and worn out. Last author covered hygiene like, wow. If but didn't here, really, you know. If you're here in episode three and you haven't seen episode two, wow. and you want an interesting ride, I mean, re read the captions first. Um, That one definitely has some hygiene things. You betcha. Uh -huh. All right. <clears throat> My toes are freezing to the street. I slipped in behind her, shrugging off her coat. She said, Adam, this is the friend I've told you about. Not a penny to her name, cat cook, but God, just look at her. Your friend is gay for you. I was about to say, wow, friend has became incredibly gay for you. And also is advertising you to men. I seems like a weird... Like, incredibly aesthetically charmed. Like, God, she's just so decorative. I can't stand seeing her dressed like that. You know what? If we put her on your arm, you could clothe her properly and I could enjoy it more. Right. It would just look great in my social setting. Uh-huh. Which, you know, that is But also, they also did like each other, too. That like, is a form of, of, like, aesthetic attraction that has nothing to do with romance or sex. Oh, yeah. And, and it totally, totally does exist. The reason, though, why I always push stuff like that, though, is because you have way too much of the, the, the stellar best friend who yeah. apparently expresses no interest in, I'm just here for you, Ellie, or whatever the fuck the name of the main character. Right, right, here we go. My face went red, and I shot Lucy a withering look, but Adam only smiled. Lucy is nothing, if not blunt, he said. Don't worry. I'm used to it. I've heard far worse come out of her mouth. And she's right. And also, didn't oh, she say that they were best friends before? How is it? Those are, I'm so surprised that my friend could ever say this thing. Uh, haven't you been around this person? You were friends before? I don't think she's a, the protagonist is actually surprised. She's just embarrassed. Okay. And then he's explaining as if they don't know each other well. Okay. So, like, what's literally happening here is the two of them are best friends. And then her friend, who's outspoken and blunt, says something that embarrasses her in front of a boy because she's familiar with this boy and that's who she is. And the boy then treats our protagonist, Juliet, like she doesn't know her friend is like this. Right. He's trying to handle her embarrassment. And All going, right. okay. you know, don't worry about it. All right, it's fine. So he's probably being a little awkward as well, but go playing it off as charming. If here, I'll support you. Mm -hmm. Let's analyze this thing. All right. Don't worry. I'm used to it. I've heard far worse come out of her mouth. And she's right. At least about the last part. I jerked my head toward him, expecting a leer, but he was being sincere, which only left me feeling more at a loss for words. Because, well... Well, I can totally perceive the difference after I've been tortured and harassed, basically, by people around me. I can easily perceive the difference between, well, you're honest and you're being a creep. <clears throat> Where are they? Lucy asked, ignoring both of us. A body roar slipped from the back room, and Lucy grinned and headed toward the sound. I expected Adam to follow her, but his gaze found me instead. He smiled again. Startled, I paused a second too long. I'm used to men being creeps at me, but a man actually being interested in me is weird. Sorry. <laughs> because there's totally a difference when you're Dudes freaked out. Dudes are always looking at me for what's under my clothes, but a dude looking at me is weird. Okay. This is common book trope. This is very popular. I shouldn't find this remarkable at all, except for I don't usually read this kind of And except the thing book. is, is that this should be remarkable, we because go, we this go. is still creepy. He smiled again. Startled, I paused a second too long. This was new. No vulgar winks. No glances at my chest. I was supposed to say something pleasant, but instead I drew a breath in, like a secret I had to keep close. I knew how to handle cruelty, not kindness. He's not being kind. He's just being pleasant, I think. I, he's, I think he's being just kind of, like, trying to be friendly. And again, yeah. I'm confused going, if you're so used to being tortured or harassed, this sort of stuff, at least to me in my experience, never actually made me comfortable at all. It actually made me more uncomfortable because you always assume that there's something hiding underneath yeah. it. Yeah, so if you're used to people being um, predators, Pre you really tend to act like prey in all cases. You don't usually trust someone this straight out. Just by going, you're not like the other ones in two seconds. But yeah, I mean, the, it the, can the visual be... behavior of you're not winking or leering or, you know, checking me out, undressing me with your eyes. Sure. But this seems to, I don't know, it feels like a bit much. Mm -hmm. It happens, unfortunately. May a I lot. take your coat? He asked. I realized I had my arms wrapped tightly around my chest, though it was pleasantly warm inside the house. I forced my arms apart and slid the coat off. Thank you. My voice was barely audible. We followed Lucy down the hall to a sitting room where a group of lanky medical students reclined on leather sofas, sipping glasses of honey-colored liquid. 
Winter examinations had just ended, and they were clearly deep into their celebration. This was the kind of thing... They were clearly drunk off their asses. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. The kind of thing Lucy <clears throat> adored. Breaking up a boys' club, drinking gin and playing cards, and reveling in their shocked faces. She got away with it under the pretense of visiting her cousin, though this was a far step from the elderly aunt's parlor where Lucy was supposed to be meeting him. Adam stepped forward to join the crowd, laughing at something someone said. I tried to feel at ease in the unfamiliar crowd, too aware of my shabby dress and chapped hands. Smile, mother would have whispered. You belong among these people. Once you lived here. But first, I needed to gauge how drunk they were. The lay of the room. Okay, now that's more prey behavior uh -huh. of going, I am a little more, like, uncomfortable. Who but was... the thing is, I'm like, has she been around a lot of drunk people then? Like, who abused her? Go ahead. Who was most likely not to laugh at my poor clothes? Analyzing. Always analyzing. I couldn't feel safe until I knew every aspect of what I was facing. Mother had been so confident around other people. Always able to talk about the church sermon that morning, about the rising price of coffee. I mean, your mother doesn't sound like she was raped or th had the threat of rape hanging over her, but okay. But I'd taken after my father when it came to social situations. Awkward. Shy. More apt to study the crowd like some social experiment than to join in. Well, if she's always been like this since she was young, then I guess... There you go. Maybe? Yeah. But it seems like she'd but be I... more skeptical of the first uh, boy. Of the boy. That's, that's why I'm saying she... that doesn't make any sense. If that's who she is all the time. Mm-hmm. I'm more like my dad. I'm always constantly wondering. Then you or, should have wondered your ass off about what the hell the guy actually wanted. Or it could be a case of the author not really explaining she's an introvert and feels comfortable with less people, more comfortable with less people. And had she met each one of these people individually alone, she would have been lots more comfortable. And mm -hmm. it's really crowds that bother her. Mm -hmm. And there's that, too. I, I, <clears throat> anyway. Lucy had tucked herself on the sofa between a blonde-haired boy and one with a face as red as an apple. A half-empty rum bottle dangled, dangled from her graceful fingers. When she saw me hanging back in the doorway, she stood and sauntered over. The sooner you find a husband, she growled playfully, the sooner you can stop scrubbing floors, so pick one of them and say something charming. That's adorable. She's like, I want to get you married so we can hang out, all right? And also going so you can get out of the shitty situation. You are actually my friend. I have been frustrated about you for a while. If I can just hook you up with someone who can take care of you. Aha, uh -huh, which is fairly realistic. Going, It is. Yeah. I swallowed. My eyes drifted to Adam. Lucy, men like these... Oh, <clears throat> Lucy, men like these don't marry girls like me. You haven't the faintest idea what men want. They don't want some snobbish, poor-faced brat... Plucking at needlepoint all day. Yes, but I'm a maid. A temporary situation? She waved it away. As if That's also bullcrap, too. Plenty of men felt entitled to women, and very much... So the thing was, socially speaking, women actually had more social class freedom because they could marry up. And men, men could, could not. not. Men could not marry up. It's much like today's Tinder, where women get 900 attempts of interest, and men have to try. Uh huh. Men may not get any ever, even with, you know, a really successful profile. Yeah, pretty much. Anyway. <clears throat> a temporary situation. Uh, she waved it away as if my last few years of backbreaking work were nothing more than a lark. She jabbed me in the side. You come from money, from class, so show a little. She held the bottle out to me. I wanted to tell her that sipping rum straight from a bottle wasn't exactly showing class. Hi, class! She suddenly me... becomes the Michael Jackson. Was that the Michael that dumps the, the water over the head in the chair? No, that's not. I Michael don't know Jack. who that's the hell from, it. That's from. Um... I don't remember what it's from. Oh, God, I should. Now have you don't it. know what. It... <laughs> okay, it's a freaking dancing movie. It's a woman who does it. Uh huh. Um, she's a welder and an artistic dancer, and I cannot remember I... the stupid thing. Flash, flash dance. Flash dance. Flash dance. Okay, yeah. Okay. I can't believe you thought she was Michael Jackson. It's That's amazing. Fu I swear, I'm That's like, amazing. it seems that eccentric amazing. enough. The only thing is, is that I've only They're really ethnic seen... and they have curly hair. That's it. That's all I care. I actually don't recall the individual really involved at all. It's just the way that the, the theatrics fine, are done. Yeah. It reminds me of Michael Jackson. It reminds a lot of his, a lot of his stage performances were that kind of theatric. Uh -huh. And it's been duplicated about nine million times. Oh, since Jesus. Yeah. Everywhere. It was iconic. All right. Uh, for, for a reason. <clears throat> All right, let's see. Pouring gin down Sipping her face. Sipping rum from the bottle. Yep. But I'd only earned, I'd only earned myself another jab. I glanced at Adam. I'd never been good at guessing people's feelings. 
I had to study their reactions instead. And in this situation, it didn't take much to conclude I wasn't what these men wanted, despite Lucy's insistence. But maybe I could pretend to be. Hesitantly, I took a sip. The blonde boy tugged Lucy to the sofa next to him. You must help us end a debate, Miss Radcliffe. Cecil says the human body contains 210 bones. And I say 211. Lucy batted her, love, her pretty lashes. This um, is the argument you're having well, about... I'm sure I don't know. I sighed and leaned into the door frame. The boy took her chin in his hand. If you'll be so good as to hold still, I'll count and we can find our answer. Oh my God. He touched a finger to her skull. One. I rolled my eyes as the boy dropped his finger lower to her shoulder bones. Two and three. His fingers ran slowly, seductively along her clavicle. Four. Then his finger traced even lower to the thin skin covering her breastbone. Five, he said, so drawn out that I could smell the rum on his breath. From across the room, ah, five, I, five. Like, I cleared my throat. The other boys watched, riveted, as the boys' fingers drifted lower and lower over Lucy's neckline. They're like, neckline. we get a free porn. Why not just skip the pretense and grab her breast? Lucy was no better giggling like she was enjoying it. Exasperated, I slapped his pasty hand off her chest. When did you get right next to them? You're leaning on a doorway. Hang on, what happened? Hang yeah, on. I was like, what? Exasperated, I went over to them and slapped his hand away. The whole room went still. Wait your turn, darling, the boy said, and they all laughed. He turned back to Lucy, holding up that ridiculous finger. 206, I said. This got their attention. Lucy took the bottle from my hand and fell back against the leather sofa with an exasperated sigh. I beg your pardon, the boy said. <gasps> Two hundred. She's got to be accurate and ruin all the fun. Because you're not like other girls. You, you actually just... know the answer and you won't play stupid. Damn it. Two hundred six, I repeated, feeling my cheeks warm. There are 206 bones in the body. I would think, as a medical student, you would know that. Lucy's head shook at my hopelessness. You're going to be a nerd. You won't be sexy. But her lips cracked in a smile regardless. She's like, okay, The blonde you're my boy's mouth went slack. Because she told off the medical nerd mm -hmm. that the, you actually suck at this. Before he could think. If you doubt me, tell me how many bones are in the human hand. The boys took no offense at my remark. On the contrary, they seemed all the more drawn to me for it. They're maybe, like, shit, yeah, hey, you know what you're talking about. Maybe I was the kind of girl they wanted after all. Lucy's only acknowledgement was an approving tip of the rum bottle in my direction. Holy cow, that was funny. I'll take a, that wager, Adam interrupted, leveling his handsome green eyes at me. Lucy jumped up and wrapped her arms around my shoulders. Oh, good. And what's the wager, then? I'll not just have Juliet risk her reputation for less than a kiss. Oh, God, she is selling her. Uh, she, she is. I immediately turned red, but Adam only grinned. My prize, if I am right, shall be a kiss. And if I am wrong, if you are wrong... I interjected, feeling reckless. I grabbed the rum from Lucy and tipped the bottle back, letting the warm liquid chase away my insecurity. You must call on me wearing a lady's bonnet. He walked around the sofa and took the bottle. The confidence in his step told me he didn't intend to lose. He set the bottle on the side table and skimmed his forefinger, tantalizingly along the delicate bones in the back of my hand. I Where my I lips. went, you're a predator! Sorry. I keep... Where a moment ago, when a man was touching my hand, I was freaking out, and now... It's appealing. Because, you know, I'm kind of drunk. Well, and also, I feel like he's hot. Uh-huh. Well, he's hot. It's not creepy if he's Because, you know, to me. hot men never rape people. Sorry. Well, I'm... and B, it's not creepy if I'm also attracted to him. It, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. All right. I parted my lips, curling my toes to keep from I'm also jerking... like, why ah, wouldn't... To keep from jerking my hand away. There oh, she is. Good. Okay. Look, go, character, go. <clears throat> this wasn't Dr. Hastings. I told myself. Ah! Yes, Predator, consistent character, good job! You're, you're, she's a little slow on the uptake, which, I mean, is probably the author's style, but it's there. It's so working. It's, it's getting there. This is, this is good. She, right. She's starting to get into it. Okay. Adam was hardly shoving his hand down my neckline. It was just an innocent touch. Twenty-four, he said. I felt a triumphant swell. Wrong. Twenty-seven. Lucy gave my leg a pinch, and I remembered to smile. This was supposed to be flirtatious. Fun. Adam's eyes danced devilishly. And how would a girl know such a thing? I straightened. Whether I'm right or wrong has nothing to do with 
gender. I paused. I'm also, not like other girls, sorry. I'm <laughs> also, I'm right. Adam smirked. Girls don't study science. My confidence faltered. I knew how many bones there were in the human hand because I was my father's daughter. When I was a child, father would give me physiology lessons. Would give physiology lessons to our servant boy, Montgomery. Despite those who claimed the lower classes were incapable of learning. He considered women naturally deficient, however, so I would hide in the laboratory closet during lessons, and Montgomery would slip me books to study. But I could hardly tell these young men that. So she has to lose. Every medical student knew mm. the name Moreau. They would remember the scandal. Lucy jumped to my defense. Juliet knows more than a lot of you. She works in the medical building. She probably spent more time around cadavers than you, Lily Spirits. I gritted my teeth, wishing she hadn't told them. It was one thing to be a maid. Another to clean the laboratory after their botched surgeries. But Adam arched an eyebrow, interested. Is that so? Well then, I have a different wager for you, miss. We're not going to address whether or not you won. His eyes Oh uh, yeah, danced. I was about to say, he, he lost and he won't acknowledge it. That's, that's His point. eyes danced with something more dangerous than a kiss. I have a key to the foliage and you must know your way around. Let's find one of your skeletons and count for ourselves. Glances darted among the other boys like sparks in a fire. They prodded one another, goading each other on in, on in, goading each other on in anticipation of the idea of a clandestine trip into the bowels of a medical building. Lucy gave me an impish shrug. Why not? I hesitated. I'd spent enough time in those dark halls. There was a darkness there that had worked its way into the hollow spaces between my bones, a darkness that clung to the hallways. Do you know what I think is funny? That there aren't if you have healthy joints. Yes, I was gonna say, but even then, you still either have fluid or you have tissue. Or yeah, you, you have, don't just it's have not, air in your body. Yeah, I'm like, you would die. Mm. So one thing everybody needs to learn, do not get air in your body. Do not Outside hollow, of your lungs. Don't have hollow spaces <laughs> inside of your body. Like, whoa. <laughs> I'm suffering from hollow spaces of the body. It's quite right. an affliction. People are going, how are, you, how are you not dead? That clung to the hallways like my father's shadow, smelling of formaldehyde and his favorite apricot preserves. The night was supposed to be about escaping the darkness, if not in the arms of a future husband, at least in a few light-hearted moments. I shook my head. But the boys had made up their minds, and there was no convincing them otherwise. Are you trying to get out of a kiss? Adam teased. Ah, uh, she won, but okay, so we have to prove that, you know, okay. I didn't respond. My desire for flirtation had evaporated at the mention of the university basements. But if Lucy didn't balk at the idea of seeing a skeleton... Shortly... Okay, I just thought you said, if Lucy. You know, if, if Lucy. a Flucy. Yes. You know, my friend, you know, if Lucy. If Lucy. Yeah, it's, it's Flucy, <clears throat> you know, like a flu... I a fish. Clenched, I cleaned the cobwebs from the creaky bones every night. So what was holding me back? Lucy leaned in and whispered in my ear, Adam wants to impress you with how brave he is, you idiot. Swoon when you see the skeleton and fall into his arms. Men love that sort of thing. My stomach tightened. God, was this what normal girls did? Feign weakness? I can never imagine Mother, with all her strict morals, doing something so scandalous as slipping into forbidden hallways on a dare. But Father, he wouldn't have hesitated. Socially awkward, but a daring rule breaker. Uh, right. <sighs> he would have been the one egging them on. Dash it! I snatched the rum and poured the last few swallows down my throat. The boys cheered. I ignored the queasy feeling in my stomach. Not from the rum. On the thought of those dark hallways we were soon to enter. Chapter two. Oh we bundled into I our totally coats checked. and slipped into the cold night, crossing the strand toward the university's brick archway. I'm surprised someone somewhere didn't offer her a better coat, or that her friend didn't bring her one to wear for the night or something. Right? I mean, there's probably something about it, but I find it odd that her friend isn't like, here, have something warmer. Right. This late, only a few lanterns shone in the upper windows. Going, I brought you a jacket. We're going out tonight. Come with me. I mean, because that mm -hmm. happens all the time in stories. Like, you have Or like... I'll put you in nicer clothes for tonight. I'm surprised she didn't be like, all right, I'm going to shove you in the corner of this alleyway, strip your ratty clothes off, shove you into one of my dresses, and f scoot you into this door. Fa Good, look, boys. All right, let we got just, boys. Let me just kick your clothes off into a corner. You can put them on later. No one will steal them. They're horrid. Right. Like, that, that sounds like a friend. One that's desperate to get you out of your social slum. Uh-huh, pretty much. This... Or, like, actually a very interested friend, too. I don't know, I'm like, uh, there, there are lots of but ways. But one that's also very self-possessed. Uh -huh. Going, I have these ideas, I'm going to execute them. All right. 
The boys passed a bottle around with hushed laughter at being on school grounds after hours. I wrapped my arm around Lucy's and tried to join the mirth, but the warmth didn't spread below my smile. For the boys, this taste of mild scandal was titillating. They'd never known real scandal. I'm sorry, you can't have real scandal. Or how it could tear a person apart. My friend here, scandal, going, well, I'm sorry, it's okay. And the last one, Inedible. they said, they said their lies came frequently to them. And I'm like, I'm not there, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, lies cannot come frequently to them. Lies They're is here. They're fictional. <laughs> lies is real and they are fictional. <laughs> ah! Ah! All right. Hmm. They'd never know real scandal or how it could tear a person apart. Because what happened to you could never happen to anyone else ever. Especially right. someone who is just like you used to be. It couldn't happen to anyone else or any of them. It could never happen to them because that's exactly what everyone said. It could never happen to you. To me, right? All right. Adam led us to the side of the building. Through a row of hedges to a small black door I'd used only once or twice. He unlocked it and held it open. Hesitation rooted my feet to the ground, but a gentle tug from Lucy led me inside. The door closed, plunging us into darkness broken only by the moonlight from one high window. The hallway filled with the eerie silence of unused rooms. My hands itched for a rag and brush as a legitimate reason to be there. Coming on a lark to settle a silly rager, risking my job. It didn't feel right. Lucy squinted into the darkness, but I kept my eyes on the tile floor. I already knew what lay at the end of the hall. Well? Adam asked. Which way to the skeletons, Mademoiselle Guillotine? Mademoiselle Guillotine, wow. I started to head to the small door to the storage chambers, but a light at the opposite end of the corridor caught my eye. The operating theater. Odd. No one should have been there this late. Something about the light chilled my blood. It could only mean trouble. We're not alone, I said, nodding toward the door. The boys followed my gaze and grew quiet. Lucy slid off her glove and found my hair, hand in the dark. Let's go on anyway! No, friend, this is where you go. Adam uh, started no. toward the operating theater. Oh, it's Adam's fault this time. Okay. But I grabbed the fabric of his cuff to hold him back. It's the anime move. Oof, I'll grab your cuff. Hang on, senpai! <laughs> <laughs> the hallways were filled with the normal smells. Chemicals and rotten things. Usually it didn't bother me, but tonight it felt so overpowering that my head started to spin. Away. I mean, you are kind of drunk. You also have... I have no idea what your food state is. Especially if you went from, I wasn't working, to I drank. Do you know, okay, so thing to learn. If you're ever going to drink, drink water. Try not to drink alcohol Just alcohol. On an empty and, stomach. And also eat. Mm -hmm. Like, don't go immediately into boozifying yourself. Um, a wave of weakness hit me, and I grabbed his wrist harder. Wait, you grabbed his cuff, and now you're grabbing his wrist. Uh, all right. Can't. I grabbed his cuff with his wrist in it, and now I'm grabbing his wrist harder. Are you all right? He asked. I waited a few seconds for the spell to pass. These spells were not uncommon, coming upon me suddenly, usually in the late evening. Oh I no, wasn't... she's going to turn into a thing. Anyway, sorry, we know some things. Go ahead. Though I wasn't about to explain their source to him. The skeletons are the other way, I said. Someone's in the theater after hours. Whatever they're doing has to be good. The skeletons can wait. His voice was charged. This was a game to them, I realized. If they got caught, the dean might give them a stern talking to. I would lose my livelihood. He cocked his head. You aren't scared, are you? I scowled and let go of his cuff, which was also his wrist. I'm sorry, Arthur. I want to support you. <laughs> of course I wasn't scared. We made our way silently down the hall. As we approached the closed door, I sa a sound began to gnaw at my ears. It took Five. me back to my childhood. When I would hide outside the door to Father's laboratory, listening, trying to imagine what was happening within before the servants chased me off, the sound grew louder. A scrape. Scrape. Unaccustomed to being in the labo laboratory, Lucy threw me a puzzled look. But I knew that sound. The scrape of scalpel on stone. A gesture surgeons made to clean the flesh from the blade between cuts. Adam threw open the door. A half dozen students huddled around a table in the center of the room, over which a single lamp formed an island of light. They looked up when we entered, and then after a few seconds, their faces relaxed with recognition. Adam, you cad! Get in and close the door! said one of the students. He threw Lucy and me an annoyed look. What are you doing here? <clears throat> There'll be no trouble. Right, ladies? Adam raised his eyebrow, but I didn't answer. A good part of me contemplated bolting out of the door and leaving them to their sick lark. Yet, I didn't. As we drifted closer with hesitant steps, I could feel the stiffness in my bones easing, as though releasing some pent-up, slippery curiosity from between my joints. Why were they in the operating theater after dark? 
Adam peered over the surgeon's shoulder. Their bodies blocked the table, but the metallic smell of fresh blood reached me, making my head spin. Lucy pressed a handkerchief to her mouth. Memories of my father flooded me. As a surgeon, blood had been his medium, like ink to a writer. Our fortune had been built on blood. The orchid odor infused into the very bricks of our house, the clothes that we wore. To me, blood smelled like home. I shook away the feeling. Father left us, I reminded myself. Betrayed us. But I still couldn't help missing him. They shouldn't, they shouldn't be here, I murmured. This building's closed to students at night. But before Lucy could answer, the scrape of the scalpel sounded again, drawing my gaze irresistibly to the table. We stepped forward. The boys paid us little attention except Adam, who moved aside to make room. My breath caught. On the table lay a dead rabbit, its fur white as snow and spotted with blood. Its belly had been sliced open, and several organs lay on the table. Lucy gasped and covered her eyes. My eyes were wide. I felt vaguely sorry for the dead rabbit, but it was a far-off sort of thought, something Mother might have felt. I wasn't naive. Dissection was a necessary part of science. It was how doctors were able to develop medicine and how surgeons saved lives. I'd only ever glimpsed dissection a handful of times, peeking through the keyhole of Father's laboratory or cleaning up after medical students. After work in my small room at the lodging house, I'd studied the diagrams of my father's old copy of Longman's Atom Anatomical Reference. But black and white illustrations were a poor substitute for the real thing. Now my eyes devoured the rabbit's body, trying to match the fleshy bits of organs and bone to the ink diagrams I knew by heart. An urge raced through my veins to touch the straighted, striated muscle of the heart, feel the smooth length of intestine. Lucy clutched her stomach, looking pale. I watched her curiously. I didn't feel the need to turn away like normal ladies should. Mother had drilled me into the standards of proper young ladies, but my impulses didn't always obey, so I had learned to hide them instead. I looked back at the rabbit. Creeping vines of worry wound around my ankles and up my legs. Something's wrong. The student performing the surgery glanced up, irritated, before selecting another scalpel and returning to work. Shh! Adam breathed in my ear. My chest tightened as... My eyes darted over the rabbit. There, the rabbit's rear foot jerked, and there, its chest rose and fell in quick breaths. I clasped Lucy's hand, feeling the blood rushing to the base of my skull. My brain processed the movements disjointedly, with an odd feeling like I had seen all this before. I gasped. It's alive. It seems odd that it would be alive without its heart beating, but that's me. I, that's fine. I think that's part of the horror in the situation of going, it is somehow still alive, it should not be alive. You can see its heart, it's had been, it's got its organs out on the table. But the organs aren't functioning, because mm -hmm. the heart should be out beating, mm -hmm. not out still. Right. Anyway, <clears throat> I turn, let's see, the rabbit's glassy eye blinked. My heart faltered. I turned to Adam, bewildered, and then back to the table where the boys continued to operate. They ignored me as they ignored the rabbit's movements. Something white and hot filled my head, and I gripped the edge of the table, jolting it. It's not dead! The surgeon turned to Adam in annoyance. You'd better keep him quiet. It isn't supposed to be alive, Lucy stammered, her face pale. The handkerchief slipped from her hand, falling to the floor slowly, dreamlike. Why is it alive? Vivisection. The word came out of me like a vile thing trying to escape. Dissection of living creatures. I took a step back, wanting nothing to do with it. Dissection was one thing. So I hate to say that that's actual a goddamn thing. It was, uh, there's an old book, it's called On the uh, Heart and the Movement of Blood, or whatever the heck it is. I actually have the book. It was one book we read where the guy talks in it, like he did live dissections, live vivisections on animals. Indeed. And it was pretty <laughs> horrifying to read, like even in the old text. Um, because the style's very different. So Scandal um, <laughs> had a complex and thorough high school education where they went for a complete curricula of social, political, scientific, and medical exposure. Mm -hmm. And this was a book they read in high school. And it was very interesting. And yet, a lot of us were incredibly disturbed by it because, well... Most people don't really talk about the fact of, well, this is how they initially did a lot of their studies. You take dogs off the street and you cut their brains open while they're still alive. You cut their, you know, bodies apart while they're still functioning. And 
there sometimes there would be interesting little notes that is in that book from them mentioning right. a casual thing. So so there is going to be so much warning of like you know body <laughs> horror and dissection and gore and such on here. Yeah, pretty but much. There we go. Ta -da. Hopefully you read those if you've gotten to this part. Ta -da! Woo! All right. I took a step back, wanting nothing to do with it. Dissection was one thing. What they were doing on that table was only cruel. It's just a rabbit. Adam hissed. Lucy began to sway. I couldn't tear my eyes off the operation. Have they even bothered to anesthetize it? That actually was really uncommon and also really expensive, my dear. Yeah. So what you're asking for was not a thing simply because they'd be like, it's an animal. Yeah, the thing is, is it, uh, bothering to anesthetize it wouldn't be something that she'd be aware of, really. Yeah, that wasn't uh, without socially having a, thing. a really strange level of projected empathy, because they off they didn't even always anesthetize people for a lot of things. Nope. We're in uh, early medicine. Let's see. Anyway, I'm fine. It's against the law. I muttered. My pulse matched the thumps of the frightened rabbit's still beating heart. Wait, it wasn't beating a minute ago when she went to touch the heart. Yeah, what? But now it's huh? beating. Okay, Arthur, Arthur, I feel like you changed what you were doing mid-pace. Because unless she had one of those... Unless she wasn't really seen very well. Slow motion, like, hyper-adrenaline moments where she just stared and saw the heart and then looked over the thing in, like, an instant that seemed like an eon and didn't see any movement. This feels odd. Uh, yeah, it does. And, and you didn't do this time stood still as I saw the organs laid out in front of me kind of thing. Mm -hmm. All right. I looked... At the placement of the organs on the table, at the equipment carefully laid out. It was all familiar to me. Too familiar. Vivisection is prohibited by the university, I said louder. So is having women in the operating theater, the surgeon said, meeting my eyes. But you're here, aren't you? Well, that was of, too much for them. Bunch of Judies, a dark-haired boy said with a sneer. The others laughed, and he set down a cruel, a curled paper covered with diagrams. I caught sight of the rough ink outline of a rabbit splayed apart, incisioned, cut, marked, with dotted lines. This, too, was familiar. I snatched the paper. The boy protested, but I turned my back on him. My ears roared with warm crackling. The whole room suddenly felt distant, as though I was watching myself react. I knew this diagram. The tight handwriting, the black dotted incision lines. From somewhere deep within, I recognized it. Behind me, the surgeon remarked to another boy in a whisper, Intestines of a flesh-toned color, pulsing slightly, likely from an unfinished digestion. Yes, there I see the contents moving. With shaking fingers, I unfolded the paper's dog-eared right corner. Initials were scrawled on the diagram. H.M. Blood rushed to my ears, drowning out the sound of the boys and the rabbit and the clicking electric light. H.M. Henry Moreau. My father. Though his old diagram... Through his old diagram, these boys had resurrected my father's ghost in the very theater where he used to teach. I was flooded with a shivering uneasiness. As a child, I worshipped my father, and now I hated him for abandoning us. Mother had fe fervently denied that the rumors were true, but I wondered if she just couldn't bear to have married a monster. Suddenly the rabbit jolted and let out a scream so unnatural that I instinctively made the sign of a cross. <sighs> By the way, if anybody doesn't know, rabbits do actually scream... They can scream, but this is a very dramatized, slow-paced, horror, you know, made-up version of what oh. we're going on. The thing would already be squealing and screeching, because it's in pain. I say, or yeah. something <clears throat> strange went on. Mm-hmm. Mm. All right. Good Lord. Adam said, just watching with wide eyes. Jones, you cat, it's waking up. Jones rushed to the table, which was lined with steel blades and needles the length of my forearm. I gave it a proper dose, he shuddered. Searching through the glass files, the rabbit's screams pierced my skull. I slammed my hands against the table, the paper falling to the side. End this! I cried. It's in pain! Lucy sobbed. The surgeon didn't move. Frustrated, I grabbed him by the sleeve. Do something! Put it out of its misery! Still, none of the boys moved. As medical students, they should have been trained for any situation. But they were frozen, so I acted instead. On the table beside me was a set of operating instruments. I wrapped my hand around the handle of an axe, normally used for separating the sternum of cadavers. I took a deep breath, focusing on the rabbit's neck. In a movement I had known, I, had, I knew had to be fast and hard, I brought down the axe. The rabbit's screaming stopped. The awful tension in my chest dripped out onto the wet floor. I stared at the axe, distantly, my brain not yet connecting it with the blood on my hands. 
The axe fell from my grasp, crashing to the floor. Everyone flinched. Everyone but me. Lucy grabbed my shoulder. We're leaving, she said her voice, strained. I swallowed. The diagram lay on the table, a cold reminder of my father's hand in all of this. I snatched it and whirled on the dark-haired boy. Where did you get this? I demanded. He only gasped. I shook him, but the surgeon interrupted. Billingsgate, the blue bo Billingsgate, the blue bore in. His eyes flashed to the axe on the floor. There's a doctor there. Lucy's hand tightened in mine. I stared at the axe. Someone bent down to pick it up. Hesitantly. Adam. Our eyes met and I saw his horror at what I'd done. And more. Disgust. Lucy was wrong. He wouldn't want to marry me. I was cold, strange, and monstrous to those boys, just like my father. No one could love a monster. Come on. She tugged me through the hallways to the street outside. It was cold, but my numb skin barely felt it. A few people passed us, bundled up, too concerned about the weather to notice the blood on our cheeks. Lucy leaned against a brick wall and pressed my hand. Oh, it's her fine. Chest. You just look like the regular ye old Victorian, you know, person who has the consumption. Well, I have this problem going, you chopped off the rabbit's head and it splattered blood all Everywhere? over. Everywhere? But didn't say anything, but now you have blood on your faces? Like, how did this happen? Let alone if Lucy was backing, you know, back away, away from the group and swooning. It splattered mightily all over everyone and got <laughs> to her as well. So what it is, is she had what a Kill you... Bill moment and she decided to spray blood everywhere. So this rabbit is basically, you know, Uma Thurman. Um, you mean, you mean our protag is basically Uma Thurman. Uh, no, the rabbit, because the rabbit spurted blood. I guess, yeah, I guess. Okay, she, yeah. I, I guess the protag would be. <laughs> I was like, y you have to, the, the bride wasn't spurting blood everywhere. She was causing it to spurt. It's true. But she did, I think, at one point spurt a lot of blood herself? Mm, nope. No? We never saw her get shot in the head. It just happened. Okay. I mean, she bled some, but it wasn't spraying blood of dramatic theater. That's it's true. Fine. It's, that's true. All right. Um, <clears throat> my God, you cut off its head. My blood... Blood was on my hands, on the tattered lace of my sleeves, even dotting the diamond ring my mother had left me that somehow no one had taken from me. Whoa! Hang Holy on! Holy crap! And you wouldn't be hiding and wouldn't wear it work? And oh my god, what is wrong? Okay, now, author, you're just being dumb. I've lost like, it. Like, you were starting to be ridiculous because, yeah, you're right, lies. It's the, 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 the goofy blood splurting everywhere and the rabbit abruptly starting to scream but i guess I it's don't. coming out of anesthesia which is stupid because again most people never actually gave their animals anesthesia at all because it's expensive and hard to administer uh yeah especially to an animal because shockingly they actually couldn't figure out what dosage to always give them it would kill them yeah sure i gave them the right dosage how would you know that anyway as well as again expensive if you're doing you know illicit procedures you shouldn't be using expensive things on them. But it's all right. I don't actually know a huge amount about it. But <clears> the <throat> wedding ring makes me lose suspension of disbelief. No, if people fair. are taking advantage of her. Why Left would she not right. have lost that? Right. All right. That would have been made an interesting <clears throat> plot point of her going to go, I'm going to go find my ring. I stared at the paper in my fist. The blue, the blue bore in. The blue bore in. I couldn't let myself forget that name. Lucy braced her hands on my shoulder, shaking me. Juliet, say something. They Quickly. Shouldn't, they shouldn't have done that. I said, feeling feverish in the cold night air. The paper was damp from my sweating palms, and apparently the blood on my hands. I had, I had to stop it. I felt her hand squeeze my shoulder tighter. Of course you did. Our cook kills a brace of hares for dinner all the time. That's all you did. Killed a rabbit that was already going to die. But her voice was shaking. What I had done was unnatural, and we both knew it. What? A cold breeze blew up <clears> the flames, <throat> carrying the pungent smell of sweat. Of sweat unnatural, according to whomst. And Lucy's perfume. I drew a shallow breath. The rumors of so long ago crept through the streets, coming back to life. All I had were slips of memories of my father. The feel of his tweed jacket, the smell of tobacco in his hair when he kissed me goodnight. I couldn't bring myself to believe my father was the madman they said he was. But I'd been so young when it happened. Just ten years old. Ten years old is not very young. Uh, that was dope super young. I can't even remember my father. Sounds like a lot of trauma. If you were ten. Right. <clears throat> All righty. I could barely remember my father. That was I like could barely remember seven my life years ago. When I was ten years old when it's been more than the life I've had now. Wow. That 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 really As does I sound matured, like severe PTSD. More memories surfaced, deeper ones of a cold, sterile room and sounds of the night, recollections that never entirely disappeared, no matter how far I pushed them into the recesses of my mind. 
<clears throat> I didn't tell Lucy about the diagram with its initials in the corner. I didn't tell her that he used to keep it neatly in a book in his laboratory, a place I glimpsed only when the servants were cleaning. I didn't tell her that after all these years trying to accept that he must be dead, a part of me suspected otherwise. That maybe my father was alive. Alrighty, all right. so that's it. So if any of you didn't guess, the Madman's Daughter is, is a reinterpretation of slash a, sequel to making, well, maybe not a sequel. I don't know how far it goes because I haven't read it and they don't call it that. Of the Island of Dr. Moreau told from the daughter's point of view. Let me actually read the um, cover of it now or the, the description now. The summary. Summary, there we go. Book summary. <laughs> Written book, by someone else trying to sell this book. Summary. Following accusations that her scientist father gruesomely experimented on animals, 16-year-old Juliet watched as her family... Okay, six years ago. She doesn't even remember six years ago of her life. Uh, and her gentle terrible. life in London crumbled around her, and only recently has she managed to piece her world back together. But when Juliet learns her father is still alive and working on a remote tropical island, she's determined to find out if the old ah. accusations are true. Accompanied by her father's handsome young assistant, Montgomery, and an energetic castaway, Edward, Juliet travels to the island only to discover the depths of her father's insanity. Torn between horror and scientific curiosity, Juliet knows she must end her father's dangerous experiments and escape her jungle prison before it's too late. Yet as the island falls into chaos, she discovers the extent of her father's it genius sounds... and madness in her own blood. Okay, it also sounds weirdly like... So there was an old version, I was actually talking to Lies about this while they had initially bought this book up, and I went, that sounds a bit like, now that I think about it again, really sounds like the old version of, there was an old movie version that was a black and white film of this one, where they introduced a woman, and there was a cute little romance subplot, because in H.G. Wells' original book, as far as I recall, there wasn't. It See, was just about, you know, Moreau, a mad scientist, um, terrorizing the inhabitants of this island, um, and creating animals, like, taking animals and turning them into people, or attempting to do so. And they had created, like, this cult kind of around him sort of thing. It was a little messed up, but yeah, the whole woman romance subplot thing was literally just that thrown in for the movie, because that's what you did. Now, in that movie, um, did he have one that he claimed as a daughter? No. Okay, I don't so in the so. more modern one with Val Kilmer in it, there was one, uh, one of his experiments that he claimed as a daughter. However, this book says, um, the first book in a gothic suspense trilogy inspired by H.G. Wells' The Island of Dr. Moreau and has been hailed by the New York Times bestseller, beautiful writing, breakneck pacing, pulse-pounding mystery, and irresistible romance. So I mean, from what it is so far, it doesn't sound as much inspired by The Island of Dr. Moreau as a retelling of The Island of Dr. Moreau in the same way that someone doesn't say their edgy Cinderella story is inspired by, they call it a retelling. Mm-hmm. So that, that is my opinion. But that is The Mad Man's Daughter by Megan Shepard in the darkest places. So if places, you want to read it, here's... Even love is deadly. Sorry. Right. That's what it says on the cover. I mean... But yeah, if you're interested in it, please feel free to check it out. If you've read it before and you want to comment on our experience, Unless that would I'm be lovely. completely freaking wrong. Again, it's been years. I was even telling Liza going, I could be horribly remembering this itty bitty tiny sci-fi book. Like, I threw the book at them, even going, here's the book! And it's tiny and small, and actually from my high school as well. Um, anyway, so but, um, that, yeah. was, that was a preview of the book. Again, we don't really know anything about it, and that was, you know, the hot take on pieces of it. I think I think um, probably seeing eye gaze was my favorite bit. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, Scandal and I, we're trolls like that. And if you've ever watched any of our Let's Plays, that's a lot of what we do to games in general. Uh, Pick apart our books, yeah, too. and things and play with them. Um, so if you liked this, and if you would like more of this kind of content, or if you had thoughts or opinions, even if it was, God, I died of laughter, and I couldn't stand it when you both couldn't keep going because of the horse door knocker, or if it was like, really, that book was a great book, and I loved the heck out of it, and, this and I is felt why. like you were a little disrespectful or didn't give it a chance, please, in both cases, go for it. Mm -hmm. We'd love to hear your opinion. In the meantime... I am Lines. And I am Scandal. And this was Zenkoi as a backdrop to our grinding cast. Please take care of yourselves out there and have a lovely day, whatever time it may be. Bye! Bye.